Thank you so much. Today, we are talking a little bit about augmented reality for everyone every day. Um, as we know, the art and creative space is divided into traditional and digital. If we're looking at you know, museums and galleries, but not only, also in agencies, as well as creatives, we have the part that we find on the wall, which is more traditional, and we have the part that we find in the metaverse with NFTs and digital tools. And unfortunately, these two worlds are divided. What we are trying to do at Artivive and successfully doing is bringing these two worlds together. And the best solution for it, it is augmented reality. Because on one hand, traditional artworks become interactive, and on the other hand, uh, digital artworks become tangible. That means you can also own an animation, you can wear it on your t-shirt, you can have it on your tattoo, or you can also put it on your wall. How we succeeded or how we started was to create an interface and a tool that is extremely easy to use, where we're not talking about the technology, just um, help artists to create and creatives to create their own artworks without understanding how it really works. So you just have to add an image and connect it with a digital content, and then you have to save it. And this is the way how we have managed um, to grow our community. Um, to um, almost a quarter or more than a quarter of a million. And what we learned and the feedback that we got from many people is they don't really feel that it's augmented reality. They don't think about the technology, they think about how they can build the stories, how they can um, you know, transmit the, the message and create a new narrative. So what we're seeing is that we are creating a total new art form. But Artivev is not only a tool, it's a platform. So we are um, a SaaS tool where the creatives are paying to use our tool and create um, artworks. We are working with all stakeholders around the space, that means also with institutions, with universities, but also with collectors and with agencies. And we have the biggest augmented reality art community in the world. We also find new monetization possibilities um, for these creatives. We have, as mentioned, a little bit more than a quarter of a million creatives. We have more than 700,000 artworks. We have 4 million app users, and we're working with 400 institutions in 190 countries. This is the hockey stick that most investors love. And um, we also realized that we are actually very, very, very close to Snap and Facebook on the creative side. And I think the winning part is because we have a no-code solution. So we have creatives that can create, that can create augmented reality experiences without having the hustle to code and solve the issues that are coming with this. Uh, so the um, next steps that we want to achieve is to integrate the creative that creator that we have now into the app and facilitate the daily use of the app and also activate all the people that are um, getting in touch with this content to create their own content. Um, obviously, we'll also find new ways to drive the revenue. Our plan is uh, by the next year to um, achieve a 1.2 million uh, annu uh, annual re revenue. For now, our run, run rate is 840,000. Uh, 840, um, we also ha had the uh, investment of $2 million, $2 million until today and grants of $2 million, um, a little bit more than $2 million. We, oh, sorry, grants 1.5 million, <laughs> revenue 2 point, uh, 2 mi more than $2 million. Um, the market, if you're looking at it, it's growing. Um, also with the new uh, creator manifesto, we see that there are 400 million creatives. You also see that there are more and more people joining the creative space in the digital space. Uh, if we're just looking at the entry level with Canva, they have 8 million paying uh, customers as well as with Adobe 30 million professionals. So this is the market that we are addressing to. And about the team, uh, Kodin, my co-founder, who's here, um, is um, coming from um, a long history of companies that he has built. Um, I'm coming from the AR space, also had an agency in this space, and I managed to take our CTO from the agency that we created, the, where we created all the um, apps for Volkswagen and for the uh, automotive industry. Um, very short, um, we are raising one million um, to um, grow the revenue to 1.2 uh, million ARR as well as um, integrating the 
the um, app, the, the creator in the app and the gamification and scaling and sales. So that will be from my side. Thank you, judges, do you have any questions? Is it on? Uh, yeah, I don't think we can hear that. I could uh, take this mic to you. Could I? Sorry. Just as an Thanks, Sergio. Oh, it's working now. It's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, great traction. My question is, what what takes you to the next level? Like, what is causing churn? Maybe what is the the kind of pain points that you still need to solve to maybe get the conversion to paid subscriptions even even bigger and get kind of to the next level? That's a great question, and this is what we are also trying to find out now. So we have a lot of creatives that are using it for different projects, and then they're afterwards um, you know, canceling the subscription, and now we're trying to find the features that they need in order to keep the subscription going. And we're doing a lot of tests, and we see also that on the creative side, we have now AI tools as well as you know, particle systems, something that is easy to also create in the tool, and this is just on the paid version. So we are now conducting tests to see what is working the best without you know, getting the them away from our platform, but keeping them on the platform and paying. At the same time, we see that we have a huge potential in the app because we have more than 4 million app users that could be also potential creatives. So if they're going and you know interacting with the content, they can also go to a museum or to a gallery. They're downloading the app and we want to convert them as well. They can do it you know, for birthday cards or for pictures that they did from um, the holidays. So they can also start creating augmented reality through the app. And that's why I'm saying it's augmented reality for everybody every day. And what we want also to facilitate is this daily use of the app because then we will not have the churn anymore. Um, yeah, for me, the question is more related to the team. So um, I see there's a second CEO. So how does it work? And how did you meet? What is a short history of your uh, background? It's a wonderful question. Thank you very much for that. Um, so Kodina and I, we're good friends for 20 years. Um, I'm more on the creative side. I'm more on, you know, um, the product side and Codina's on the operational side. So he's taking care of everything that has to do, you know, with the finances, with the administration, as well as on the legal aspect. And I'm more on the side with the, with the creatives, with the product, with the development. And it works very good. So uh, we're doing this for five years now and we know each other for six, uh, 20 years. Um, and um, we didn't really have the fight ever, right, Codin? No. <laughs> so it's working very good. Yeah, so a great pitch. I really liked it. Uh, I also, after this, I quickly explain about the investment side. I just wanted to explain about that. Um, also, I was just wondering the two million in revenue, like you just talked about the paid product. What's included in that paid service? So, what's the? Maybe you can just talk about the monetization again. That would be nice. Yes, yes. Thank you very much for this question. So we started one half years ago a little bit less than one and a half years ago to see which is the best way how we can monetize. At the beginning, we had the, the whole platform open to onboard as many as possible because you can imagine that many people were a little bit afraid of you know, digital and augmented reality. Everything with the metaverse and NFTs helped us you know, to have distraction and the, all, everything that you have seen was organic. And now what we're trying to do is, um, like also Petri asked, is like, where is the pain point? Where are the features that they are ready to pay for? and stick around. So for example, the 3D creator, where you have your know, more ways to create content is on the paid side, but you also have a trial. And we are monetizing on the views, on the interactions with the artwork. The more interaction somebody has with the artwork, the more expensive it becomes. Does it answer your question? Yeah, makes sense, makes yeah. sense, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Great. Okay, I think that's it. If that's, thank you. If that's it for my judges. <laughs> Big round of applause for Sergio. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, did you yeah. want to say something briefly? I, yeah, I just wanted to talk about the investment side again. So basically um, how I structured that is um, because I did one startup investment show before. We reached like 4 million people per day on that. And I'm ha I have another one that's upcoming. And the startup that wins, I'm inviting that startup to that show. And we will invest like a high six-figure amount in that show. And yeah, basically you will have a fast track through that process. But of course... I only know. I only talked to one startup before for like ten minutes or so, um, uh, and basically the others I don't know yet. So we'll question you a bit more, of course. So just don't that do you think that you I send you you send me your bank details right after this, and I'll just transfer it. So just wanted to mention that so that it's clear for everyone. 
And yeah, of course, we're looking for something early stage. So if it's very massive, because we're just investing like around like 200, 250K per startup. So just so you know, um, yeah, you should be interested in that as well. If you're in, like raising 5 million or 3 million, then maybe we are like a bit, we are go really going for early stage. So maybe Petri, they could help you better than we could help you because we were like really early always. But yeah, I just wanted to mention that so it's clear for everyone. And I'm really excited and it was a great start. Really awesome. Like they are really far already and it looks really good, I think. Like the traction is massive, so that's awesome, yeah. Amazing, thank you very much. Well, it's time for our next presenter. So I'd like to welcome to the stage the founder of BrainSpark Games, Ridar Elsai. BrainSpark Games is on a mission to revolutionize the way children learn through play. We're building an ediverse of free, culturally inclusive, immersive 3D open world educational mobile games aligned with the UK national curriculum. Using augmented reality, artificial intelligence and pioneering neuro games technology, we've co-designed with our users and developed a learning through play pedagogy to deliver our upcoming games. Hi, my name is Rudar El Sai, and I'm the founder of BrainSpark Games. We're raising 1.5 million, having secured half a million pounds in Innovate UK funding already. I came up with this idea because I essentially couldn't get my boys to stop gaming. I've got two boys who are completely addicted to Fortnite. And this is literally the moment in our sitting room where I realized that if billions of children globally are playing mobile games, then why are we not using this as a, a, a way to disseminate educational content? The problem with the education system is it's just not designed for diverse learners. It's completely antiquated whichever corner of the world that you live in. Half the population of children are disengaged from learning. BAME and neurodiverse children are almost three years behind their peers. The curriculum lacks cultural diversity and a third of children are failing exams. So we'd like to invite all of you to join our mission to revolutionize the way children learn through play. We're building AI-powered, augmented reality, educational mobile games, pioneering neuro games technology. Our games can be used in the classroom as part of a, a traditional lesson plan, after school as a supplemental tool, or at home, in the park, or on the go. We're currently building out five games that have all been funded by Innovate UK. These include our climate game, which was a finalist for the uh, AWE Climate Education Prize earlier this year, history, physics, English, Midsummer Night's Dream by Shakespeare, art. And we know that we can condense 12 weeks of term time learning into just a few hours of fun, fast gameplay. This has enhanced academic performance, and of the 1,800 children that we play tested with, 99% preferred our games to traditional classroom based learning. We've had incredible feedback on our games. Our business model relies on sparkler mode remaining free for children so we can reach billions of children globally so that no child gets left behind. We're currently building uh, creator mode so that teachers, educators, homeschoolers, and even parents or children can build their own content based on pre-existing curriculum games. We've got an amazing team of experts driving our growth. We've already been working together for well over four years, and we're supported by incredible world-class mentors and angels. And although one day we do hope to be as good as Roblox and Minecraft, at the moment we're positioning our games as an alternative to revision, exams, and homework, and textbooks. That's our real competition. And we are already winning that competition hands down. We play tested our games with well over 1,800 children, parents, and teachers. We've co-designed our games with our board of brilliant brains made up of over 100 children across the globe who are already brand ambassadors. They've informed our learning through play pedagogy, and we've had amazing, absolutely staggering traction. We've had tons and tons of coverage, although we have no marketing team. And a few days ago, we were featured in the Prime Minister's report on the creative industries as one of the, the case studies in the gaming sector around the impact of educational games. Without any sales team, we've already started generating revenue, even though our games are not ready. 
This is an amazing opportunity to enter edtech and gaming industries, which are two of the fastest industries in the globe, uh, across the world. We've got three million schools that we want to target, but at the moment, we're very focused on targeting the UK city by city, trying to reach out to councils, schools, playtesting and building deep trusting relationships with our partners. Eventually, we'll use the funding to have some marketing teams, but at the moment, we're focused on um, just building those relationships. We're currently on track to meet all our key uh, milestones. We've got a team of well over seven people, and we've already secured some of our funding. We want to use any investment, whether it's this or anything else, um, to secure our key hires and to build out an AI engine that will accelerate production. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Judges, do you have any questions? Thanks, Rita. Great pitch. Um, there's uh, the, the obvious question, so distribution. Um, AR games and education has been a market for a long time that a lot of startups have tried to tackle for a long time. Uh, distribution has always been the challenge, whether you go straight to the schools, to private schools, through municipalities. Um, so talk to me a little bit more about how you're going to crack that distribution channel challenge. So, so I'm fully aware of the challenge that lots of tech companies face. And I think what's really helped us in, in terms of just the playtesting with over 1,800 children, parents, teachers, and schools over the last two years is that we're not selling them anything right now. The, the games for children are free. We've actually had adults say to us, What's to stop me from playing your games? And my response is nothing. We want you to learn, like that's the whole purpose. But if you want to capture data, if you want to integrate it with your current learning management systems, then you have to pay a very small fee, which is our creator mode. And what we're doing is building those existing relationships through trust by playtesting and co-designing with the schools. And that's worked really, really well for us. Being part of the, the government's kind of recommended report and, and you know, this flagship company as a small startup has really transformed the landscape for us. Like we're accessing councils, local government, and they're doing the introductions to the schools already. So our, our challenge isn't, can we get this into schools? Our challenge is, there is massive demand. We can't move quickly enough to, to meet that demand. Yeah, great pitch, Rita. And I was just wondering, you talked about the traction. Where do you see the most traction? What countries? I, I know you're from the UK. Like, is the most of the traction in the UK? Or where do you see the traction right now? So, so currently, we're, so a lot of the time I'm asked, well, this is just a British curriculum. We're building the games around the British curriculum to begin with, but we want to build a best of breed global curricula eventually. So once we've targeted the UK, we intend to expand across Europe, USA, English speaking regions, but then we want to target the Middle East, South Asia and Africa. The reason for this is these are massively underserved regions. They're really, really hungry for creative product. There's very low product offering. I'm from South Asia, we've got connections in the Middle East, Africa, my uh, husband's from there. So these are regions that we really understand. We can kind of accelerate our route to market, but also they enable us to build out teams and reduce our costs as well. Yeah, am amazing mission, yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question related to the curriculum and the courses. You mentioned at the beginning that it's quite important that students uh, come from different ethnicities and uh, different backgrounds. How how do you um, incorporate that into the course? And how, as a product, a game, um, do you develop that to keep it updated? Yeah, so, so what we've done very differently to other tech or gaming companies is we've really focused on building out our curriculum and our learning pedagogy. And we've spent a good three years doing that, and that's what the Innovate funding has kind of supported in, in terms of the R&D. We're now in, a, in a, a position where we can accelerate that. We're covering the core curricula, but also what we want to really um, kind of foster is that creative content, allowing teachers to come back to why they became teachers, which is often they want to inspire children. They don't want to worry about, you know, their targets in the school and the management structure. So our Creator Spark enables teachers to customize that content as the curriculum changes, as you are in different regions of the world and, and different corners, you can edit and customize that content. The one thing I will also mention is we started developing on mobile platform, but because we've had such a staggering response, we were introduced um, through the Department of International Trade to a key edutainment company in India. They've got 70 million 
million users. They're like, how quickly can you build this? And, but what, we, what they need is a low-tech solution. So we're, we've already built our prototype for the low-tech solution and our browser base so that we can access every single child in every corner of the world. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think that's the end of the question. Thank, thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Thank you very much. Great stuff. And I would like to uh, introduce the next presenter, Krasi Nikolov, the CEO and co-founder of Quark XR. Hi, everyone. I'm Krasi Nikolov, CEO and co-founder of Quark XR, and I'm here to tell you about our next-gen cloud streaming platform. XR already has amazing success stories in the B2B space, like Bell, who designed a revolutionary helicopter 10 times faster with the HTC Vive, or Kia, who introduced the EV9 in Finland through a mixed reality showcase without a physical car being present whatsoever. This is why we firmly believe that businesses are going to transition from working on 2D screens to XR devices in the next five years, starting with engineers, designers, and architects. And this transition is going to be facilitated by cloud computing and streaming. So why cloud? Well, despite all the success stories, most businesses can't take advantage of XR today. It comes down to technical reason, but this is what content looks like on most mobile headsets. Uh, this is not taking a shot at Meta or anything. It's just very hard to cre create compelling graphics on mobile chipsets. Compare this to content on the Quark XR platform, where we have billions of polygons, real-time ray tracing, beautiful textures. This type of software is impossible to run on mobile. However, it is possible to work on Quark XR because we offload all the rendering and processing to powerful NVIDIA GPUs in the cloud, and we stream the content in real time to uh, mobile devices. Unlike our competitors, we don't require the developer to integrate any SDK. Instead, we run on open standards, and any open XR application is already compatible with Quark XR, which means that our platform is the most scalable and easy to use enterprise platform out there. Today, we have two products. Quark XR for architecture, which is focused on customer presentations and design reviews for architects, designers, real estate investors. And Quark XR Enterprise, which is focused on rendering digital twins for the use cases of uh, planning and training. We have a lot more coming, like web support, uh, streaming to the browser. Uh, and more importantly, we recognize content is still an issue in, in XR. 90% of professional software does not support XR. And this is why we are creating a pipeline where designers can drag and drop their assets into an interactive Unity experience. So I think this is going to unlock a whole set of new use cases. Um, we focus on architecture, manufacturing, automotive industries because they have the most uh, and the biggest use case for rendering right now. But Quark XR is an open platform with over 40 third-party apps on it already. So we see expansion into other verticals like healthcare uh, or um, uh, luxury brands in the future very easy. We already work with some amazing brands like Bosch, TUI, uh, Deutsche Telekom, Orange, most of them in Europe, a little bit in the US, but we have a lot more on our pipeline. Um, the market is going to grow to over 10 million of enterprise uh, XR users by 2025, and this growth is being powered by what Meta, Apple, Qualcomm, and others are doing. Um, and uh, regarding our business model, we transitioned from a license-based model to a SaaS model. Quark XR for architecture starts at $100 per user per month. Quark XR Enterprise starts at $1,000 uh, per user per month. And we're launching uh, freemium and self-service for Quark XR for architecture so that uh, users can uh, upload a couple of projects for free and get started through the Quark XR website very easily. We are a team of XR OGs. We've been in the industry since 2014, uh, most of us. Um, and we are a team of 12 people right now. We are going to grow to about 
uh, 30 in the next 12 months, and we have some amazing advisors from the rendering industry. Uh, we recently closed the 700k euros round. We uh, have space for about 300 more, which is a big part of the reason I'm here. And uh, I thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, happy to take any questions. Thanks, Krasi. Um, you have a great list of first customers, but they're from a wide range of different verticals. So talk to me a little bit about your approach to go to market. Like, what is the lowest hanging fruit? Like, what is the commonality that you can attack um, in order to grow to the next level? That's a great question. As I said, we've been doing this for a while, and we've been experimenting with what is the cure use case for Cork XR. And we thought initially it's going to be training because training is the most widely uh, used uh, XR uh, use case out there. Uh, but whatever our customers do in order to benefit from Quark XR needs to be rendering heavy, right? So this is how we landed on stuff like architecture and automotive. So uh, the commonality of the customers that we are pursuing right now is they're using professional software uh, for design, for rendering, and that includes a lot of industries. It starts with architecture, interior design, real estate, but it also includes the automotive industry. Uh, I talked about luxury brands, uh, manufacturing. Um, now, digital twins is a, is a very hot topic, and enterprise people are, are uh, creating a digital twin of all their assets. We're talking about telecoms, uh, creating digital twins of their towers. And, and once you have them in a 3D environment, you can run a bunch of simulations, you can run a bunch of training. So uh, we, we're going to probably have a full circle to some of our original use cases, but the commonality is um, uh, applications that are very heavy on rendering. Um, in terms of revenues, how do you compare the revenues coming from architecture and from enterprise, and in which countries do you find your, uh, most your clients? Yeah, so we first uh, launched the enterprise uh, product because of our background. So uh, it, is, uh, it is making, so this year we're going to close at uh, 250k ARR. Uh, I think about 180 is going to come out of the enterprise uh, product, but we're pushing architecture uh, uh, really hard. We launched it three or four months ago. Um, is in terms of markets, uh, we launched in the UK, uh, Germany, Netherlands. Uh, we are now looking to expand into the US. Uh, we have customers in my native country of Bulgaria. So we're going to focus on Western Europe and the States for the next 18 months. Yeah, interesting, interesting. And how large is your team right now, I was wondering, and what's the burn rate right now? Like, how far do the 700K, how far will they take you? Oh. So, uh, we are 12 people right now. The majority of, of our team is in Bulgaria, which means pretty low burn rate. Uh, and uh, this round will get us from 250K ARR to 1 million ARR by 2025. Um, so, we plan to reach that milestone and, and raise our Series A in 25. Awesome. If we have time, maybe dig a bit deeper on, on the sales cycles and the business model. Um, who are you selling to? Like, who's the buyer in, in the organization? And, and kind of uh, talk to me about price points a little. Like, is it easy to sell because whoever can do the decision? Or is it like bigger chunks of budget that is needed for you guys? Right. So in the architecture space, we have three cohorts of customers, companies under... Uh, 10 people, under 50 and under 100. Um, and the buying persona slightly varies. Uh, in the bigger organizations, it is normally uh, somebody who is responsible for IT uh, and implementing uh, solutions. In small organizations, we are selling to the architect directly. Uh, so it, it does vary, but we found uh, the right people in the, depending on the company size. On the enterprise side, uh, we're targeting larger organizations, over a thousand employees. Uh, so there, uh, we try to stay away from innovation. 
right? Because it's a very uh, um, easy trap to fall into. We try to target either the salespeople directly or people that integrate the digital uh, solutions into the organization. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Krasi for that presentation there. And I'd like to, without further ado, welcome the next presenter, who is Mahai Strezer, the CEO of Wanda. Big round of applause, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here, for taking the time. And now for something completely different. If the clicker works, do I need to point this at something? No. Okay, thank you. My name is Mihai Streza. I'm the founder of Wonder. I have been in computer science for a little over 30 years. I started in 1991 with my first computer. And I have been in personal development and leadership development for exactly 20 years. I started out in 2003. Consciousness development, human development, if you wish. And now, this is the question for me, my vision, and for today for you as well. What are we all doing here? You know, what are we using our time for? We have, on average, about 80,000 hours in our lives that we put into our careers. There's some beautiful research from Cambridge around this. And if you work a lot on personal development, leadership development, you come to this question very quickly. What am I using my life for? This is a finite number, and it's very small. What do I do with that time? And you come very quickly to the bottom line, to the root. You know, my vision and the vision of Wonder is to contribute to a world where we have a lot more happy, healthy, and successful people. And it sounds blunt, but this is what it is. Across the street from here, the United Nations, they formulated the Sustainable Development Goals, right? I happened to be there when they were doing that here across the street in Vienna and in New York. I was in an initiative called Sustainable Energy for All. These goals say exactly the same thing. We want a world where people do better, right? And they don't answer the question, and Ban Ki-moon said back then, they're aspirational. So what does that mean? Well, it means, wouldn't it be nice if we would reach this? Who do we need to be and to become in order to have a chance at solving these? Because nobody's dealing with that question, or very little people. Look around, like, what's going on? We have climate change, we have wars, we have social inequality, we have these so-called hard problems that stand between where we are today and a world with more happy, healthy, and successful people, right? And developmental psychology tells us that we need about 10% of the population to work on themselves, to evolve their thinking, to move to the next level of thinking, of mindset, of consciousness, to facilitate global change. And this is, again, you might be wondering, well, what are we talking about? Because we want to see ARR and, you know, we're at a VR conference. What are you spending your time on? Even if you see this speech as subversive and it has nothing to do with anything, what are you spending your life on? What do you do with all your skills to help this? 10% of the population is 800 million people. How do you want to help them transform fast? And that's where technology comes into place for me as a technology guy. We'll have around 2030 about a billion headsets, VR headsets in the world. And those are devices that give you access to the most transformative technology we have ever seen until now. So what we can do, we can bring the tools that work, that already exist, transformational tools for personal transformation, into virtual reality. This is my third company, so I know that it also needs to be financially successful. Financially successful, not just viable. If you're not successful financially as a company, you have no right to exist. It means that the world doesn't need you. So we take the leeway through B2B, working at the top, working with the leadership, doing leadership development. This is what we sell. This is what we've been selling for four years. We made revenue since year one, which was 2020. Last month, we, were, we had the first month where we were cash flow positive. So we provide these trainings, transformational trainings in virtual reality to enterprises. They use it for leadership training. And then it trickles down, minus one, level minus one, minus two. Then it goes to the millions of employees worldwide. Then it goes to B2C later on in about five to 10 years. We open this up to B2C so that everybody can work on themselves with these tools. 
And you know all the advantages, and it was mentioned before, the studies that were done, PwC did one years ago, we're doing the same one with Accenture now, we're creating this. So to close with, we work with uh, over 50 global corporations who use these trainings to transform their leadership in 12 countries until now. This is working. We've seen in these three, four years now that the technology works and it does what we thought it would. We've seen that it's incredibly scalable and we've seen that people are ready to use it. So this is the point. We don't have an ask. We raised the fund in the second quarter of this year. We will, as per our fundraising strategy, we'll raise another one next year. So we're interested in connecting with people who connect with this mission so that we make a difference and don't just uh, yeah, play around with the little time we have. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, big fan of the brand name, by the way, so good choice. Um, I was wondering in terms of the courses, uh, so you say it's leadership development. How, how, how did you um, establish these courses? How can you can you keep it up to date and how do the clients respond to the courses that you have rolled out? It's, it's really interesting if you, um, <clears throat> if you work in personal development, leadership development, two things become apparent after a while. First of all, they're the same topics. They're always the same topics. Personal development, if you think of Anthony Robbins and all these crazy motivational speakers, and then you go to leadership development, Bob Keegan and all the Harvard professors, you go under the surface and they're the same topics. It's about 10 to 12 topics. This is what makes this business so incredibly scalable. Now on the business side, it's incredibly scalable on the transformational side, also on the business side. So you have about 12 topics, perspective taking, perspective seeking, the communication topics, giving feedback, navigating difficult conversations. You put them all together, it's only about 12 topics, right? So you only need to create what we're doing. We already have about half of those. So we're creating a library of these. We bring in people and institutions who can give us the validation. So we work with Harvard University and we work with uh, IMD Lausanne with the business schools and so on. So that all the stuff comes from research and from these big names, not from us. But the topics are limited. And then everybody in the world, be it a company or a person, can use these topics. And the companies do have, we get questions around a lot. Yeah, but companies want customization. Yes, sometimes they do want customizations, and with the pipeline that we've developed, we just onboarded Airbus, we customized, it took us three weeks to customize what we had to exactly what they wanted for their leadership development. That's nothing, you know, so with, with the AI tools that we have and with the pipeline, the way we built it, we can customize incredibly quickly, and that's why we're not building content every single time. We get inquiries about, can you create a training for fire safety in virtual reality? We can, but we won't because that's not the business model. The business model is we have building blocks and we sell these again and again and again to corporates and then to B2C. Talk to me a little bit about competition and what makes you stand out from competition because this is probably the busiest space there is in, in VR and B2B VR. I, I really love that question because we get that a lot in, in a different form. You know, what's your competitive advantage? People like to ask or investors like to ask. And in the meantime, I came to the point where I say it's very simple and it's not going to blow your mind. We have three of them. First of all, we have products. Second, these products work. And third, global corporations are paying money to use them. And it sounds kind of silly because everybody assumes, well, that the, everybody does that. Like, no, we have a spreadsheet with at least 100 names in it of companies who say they do training in virtual reality. So we're watching the market very closely. You go through those, you'll find out very quickly that about 70% don't have anything. They have a website and you approach them. What do you have? What can we use tomorrow? Well, if you have a concept, then we can discuss and we'll create it. And we're very good at that and so on. So you... So about 70% fall out of it. So the market looks busy if you Google for VR training. If you go into market research, 70% fall out because they have nothing. They're just fishing for clients. Then you have from the remaining 30%, I would say about a third, they have some products that don't work. Like this is something that's unacceptable. You download, uh, you download the, the installation files and you install them and they don't work. You know, I don't want to name names, but I can tell you after that if you want to. You can go to their website. 
And then you have a very, very small segment who then gives the stuff away for free because it's not good enough. Right? And they'll, they'll have names like the ones before, but they've done it with giving it away for free. So if you go through these three filters, you know, you go through the mom testing. The mom testing is, well, you go to your mom, oh, I painted a painting, you know, isn't it beautiful? Yeah, it's beautiful. Will you give me 10 euros for it? Go away. You know, you go through this mom testing of startups and you have actually very little players. And from those players, a couple of them are in the US and they're trying to sort out the US market. A couple of the biggest ones are potential buyers for us. That's part of our exit scenario. Um, a potential exit scenario, and the ones in Europe, they just don't do a good job. There's a good one that focuses on education, so they're not revenue driven, and a few ones who just try out. There's also, if, you, if I still have time to go into the sorry, Chris, I see. Okay, That's sorry. the five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Answers. Thank you. Uh, the timer is so cruel. Um, thank you very much there uh, to Mihai. And um, we're halfway through. It's unbelievable. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome our next presenter to the stage, Lily Ava Barter, the founder and CEO of Genera. Good afternoon, morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Lily, and I'm the founder of Genera. We are an outfit customization platform making outfit design accessible for millions worldwide. The story of Genera started when I dedicated my career to find digital alternatives to make fashion. It's because physical overproduction is polluting. It's the second most pollutive industry in the whole world. I started assisting businesses, universities and students, and I couldn't help but notice that the currently available software to build virtual content is really technical, and it's not really facilitating the use cases the users want to use the assets for. This aligns with the fact that the new generation is really eager to customize their presence in the virtual space. There are hundreds of, people, uh, hundreds of millions of people worldwide who are using avatars, and almost half of them really focuses on trusting those avatars because it simply helps them to express themselves. But if you want to do this, you go to platforms, you make avatars, you use game platforms. Um, usually these platforms don't really have a lot of customization options. If the user decides to do it themselves, it's really technical to build those assets, especially when you want to get it into the certain platforms because each platform has different technical requirements. So our solution is a mesh and texture customization engine that plugs into partner platforms. So we have automated export pipelines, or we also allow users to export files with one click. It's very simple, easy, accessible, and fun. We are working on white labeling and software development toolkits, so our partners can integrate our technology in a really easy way, so the users have even more seamless journeys. And in the meantime, when we're working with lifestyle brands, we are also offering their audiences a way to engage with the assets in a creative way and also offering new revenue sources for our business partners. So our B2B uh, side is really interesting and the evolution is really exciting to watch. Now, let's have a look at the product. So, when we designed Genera, the interface and the design interactions were created to make it really easy, fun and immersive. We studied 3D software, everything that's currently available. We tested the product multiple times with academia, individuals, all kinds of audiences in the last year. It has been really exciting to see the feedback. People really enjoy playing with it. One of the biggest achievements we have is the one-click export. So one of our technological partners is here today, and uh, you can test our invite-only feature where you can export your outfit with one-click. Also, we are launching an AR app, so you can design your outfit and immediately wear it in augmented reality. So come and visit us at the playground because we are demoing that there. <laughs> And we are integrating AI. Why? Because design should be accessible, easy and fun. And with generative AI tools, we can even diversify further what our users can do in the platform. In the landscape of other platforms, I think we are really, really in the leading position because we are providing an end-to-end -end journey, because I love our users and I listen to what they want. And we're trying to cover every step of the way. So I mentioned outfits are important. And it's key in multiple high growth markets. So how we are going to those markets is really interesting. We have three step go to market strategy. Currently, we are in the first step. We are building our initial traction. We have incredible partners already, wonderful traction. 
The next step in the build phase will be even more exciting because when we release our direct to avatar integrations, we will have a reach of thousands and thousands of platforms, games worldwide and how we are going to make money. So, we are already in a little bit in the revenue testing, but the most exciting part is now we are launching at the end of the year our B2C subscription and paper item solutions. And that's basically to validate to our business partnerships that people want to pay for this. And then eventually we will license our technology. So, as I mentioned, our platform is already live. We have incredible reception, very amazing early adopter community. We have done incredible partnerships, uh, um, supported a lot of emerging designers, um, allowing their content to be co-created worldwide. And right now, we are in these super exciting partnerships and discussions developing our B2B side, so we can plug into avatar platforms and games. And also, one of the most exciting things for me is our academic partnerships. There are quite a few university partners we work with, and they already integrated our software into their curriculum. I'm not building this by myself. I have an incredible team. We have a combined experience of plus, 10 plus years building games, products, XR, digital, digital fashion. And our next steps will be developing more the B2B solutions. We're already in pilot phases with the business partners, implementing our generative AI solutions or actually launching them, and then our mobile version. And our ask is actually quite simple. We are looking for 150 to 250,000 pounds, K, okay, thousand, yes, thousand pounds investment to support us in the next one year, which make, it makes us... So it makes us get to our scene at the end of next year. So thank you. Please try Genera. It's completely free. And let's dress up the metaverse. Thank you. So yeah, thanks a lot, Lily, for this great pitch. And yeah, I think you could have taken more time on the pitch because you didn't have enough time, I think it seemed like. But great pitch. And I was just wondering, like, if I understood it correctly now, the monetization, you're just getting started with that, I think? Yes, That's we have one paying pilot that we have done in September, and then the B2C subscription and paper items are launching end of this year. Okay. Was that, the, like, we could see Berber, there was like a Burberry Minecraft collaboration. Is that kind of the, the business monetization, B2B monetization? or So that was an example where bigger fashion brands partner with B2B2C studios to design digital assets, and then they end up in game platforms. And what we enable uh, companies to do is have engagement and monetization before the assets reach the end platform. So that was an example where the brands missed out on the opportunity of co-creation. But the B2B revenue sources uh, will mainly focus on licensing. So licensing our SDK technology, licensing our white label solution and where we integrate with avatar platforms we have a bundled offering so when they are licensing their bundled technology to the game platforms then we take a royalty cut okay perfect thank you thanks hi lily um what what's your kind of key traction points that you're looking for right now to to get to the next level is it do you need more creators so you have a bigger library of of uh, creations to offer to users is it more on the b2b side and if it's there kind of it, which would be your ideal partner to get really to the next stage Right, yes. So there are three things that we are wanting to reach before our seed round, which is proof of revenue. So people are paying for it. I know that they will, but obviously once we launch our subscription, I will have proof as well. Uh, continuous user growth, like again, our platform is free, accessible, it's online. So we had 1,500 users in just a couple of months. Right now we slow down on marketing to focus on our developments, but you know, growing our users, they are organically coming to us anyways. So just continuing that. And then, then the business partnerships. So actually, we're in a really lucky position. We already have them. And what I'm actually waiting for is just get there in technology from their end and from our end as well. So we've already plugged into a leading avatar platform who's actually partnered with AWE here. We're also working with another one. We plugged into the back end of Ready Player Me as well. <laughs> it's a very sneaky move. They know about us. Um, so I just want these technologies to be publicly available. Our AR app that we launched yesterday is also you know, in a demo phase. You can design your outfits and wear 
clarity and augmented reality for the first time ever. No one else does that. So all I'm just waiting for is getting stable with these technologies on, on the partnership sides as well and just launch it. I think these validation points will be incredible. It's a bit harder to work with uh, the fashion brands. So they've been asking us for money. And I understand why, because they're very afraid of what is this technology, what is the commitment that's required from them. So what I'm actually very excited about is instead focusing on music and artists. I met lots of wonderful artists who are already doing digital content and surrounding that uh, or making that into something wearable is actually something really exciting. So they're really interested and they have a much more kind of experimental affinity. So partnerships is the third one and uh, we are on the track with that. Um, I have a question related to the team. So congratulations on achieving the milestones you have achieved as a CEO and solo founder. Um, I'm just wondering, there were a lot of people on the slide, also advisors. Um, who are the people who are going to advise you to scale um, as a solo founder? Absolutely, thank you. Uh, so I'm incredibly lucky because our advisor team is just brilliant. We have Adam Nasrallah, who's our CTO advisor, and he has built millions of products. So he doesn't just advise me, he advises my lead engineer because he's also quite new in this on the way to CTO role. Uh, we have Monse Carney, who used to work with uh, one of the only digital fashion mobile applications. So she's advising me on the product strategy. Again, incredible. Uh, we are part of Innovation RC, which is the incubator of the Royal College of Art in London. It's the world's best art and design postgraduate university. And there we have an amazing dedicated mentor, Stephen Rockman, who has had 20 plus years of fundraising investment and startup experience. So I'm in very good hands. We also have incredible client advisors, Jamie Neal, who's Ami nominated, and Roxana Nazoy, our web switch strategist. So when we are going to embark on the decentralized route, we are also in good hands there. So I feel very confident that everyone is watching out for us and supporting us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Lily. <laughs> Great. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the next presenter, Tim Friedland, the co-founder and CEO of Forward Game. Hi, everyone. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, first time speaker at AWE. I'm, I'm thrilled. All right. Let's rock and roll. Where's the rock and roll? Here it is. So. Hi, everyone. As you've noticed, <laughs> over the last 30 years, we've been living through a computing evolution. First, computing had its fixed space and time, the desktop. Then along came the mobile, took the computing to go, and locked us away from the real world. But now, spatial computing offers an interrupted experience throughout the day, blending work and fun, chores and games, real and virtual. Just imagine, the year is 2040. Millions of people are experiencing digital entertainment throughout the day. They are jogging with dragons. They're vacuum cleaning little monsters. Some are even cooking with a full-size Gordon Ramsay. He's going to be pretty old by then. But the tech will be so good at providing continuous flow of entertainment, regardless of what the players are doing. So finally, the games get the whole life of a player. Now that is exactly what we are doing. We create active augmented reality games using latest computer vision and 5G, letting our players to literally step into the multiplayer action and feel like the games are blending with their surroundings. We're six years old. We have deep understanding of user experience in AR environment. That's why we're spending at least a third of development time for our every item for gamified tutorials and onboarding. And it is all true for our newest one, Stucker. True gem. Incredible, incredible game. It's built in collaboration with Keepsake, digital assets marketplace. So join the community today, get your first free NFT robot, and see how augmented reality makes digital assets tangible and meaningful. We truly believe that AR is this one missing link for massive adoption of digital assets by game developers and the players. So, today, 15% of people doing chores and 40% of people doing physical activity listen to music while doing so. 
This is 80 million people in the US alone who really want to get distracted from pain and boredom. And in 2030, when MR technologies will be completely mainstream, 73 million MR devices will be sold, and the gaming microtransactions market will reach $120 billion. We will be making games for those devices. We will be taking share from that market. And yet, today, yeah, the Robic is excited. Today, no single studio researches all of those technologies together. While all of them, together, are critical for true augmented reality experience. Actually, there might be one studio. Because even before the spatial computing puts games everywhere, those completely different and unrelated technologies, they need to mature and they need to get assembled under one umbrella. Even before we talk about the glasses, AR needs to precisely position digital content, link it to the real world. The computer vision needs to understand world objects and track the players. And all those actions and positions of multiple players need to be constantly and almost instantly relate to everyone playing. Now, here's the juice. We get access to those technologies through fostering relationships with companies that are building them, like Apple, Google, T-Mobile, and Qualcomm. We are their early access pioneers. We're bundling these technologies together, create unique integrations, grabbing these secret betas the moment they become available for us because we want to make games that feel real. We're raising our seed round because it is now time to finally grab this awesome technology and move the evolution. And we are, we are the best team in the world for the job. We are this incredible, almost impossible combo of fantastic content maker and technology researcher. We are, with this amazing ability of making real world fun, making magic out of the ordinary, and we are knowledgeable and skilled enough to crunch this crazy tech that is required for the magic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> how your projections were for 2030. So what are the steps necessary to get you there? Because it's still like several years away. So um, we have, a, we have a, like a cute and popular answer for that. And I'll start with this one, then we'll try to divide it if we have time. So uh, I really, really wanted iPhone 4 when I couldn't, but I really wanted it. There was one reason why I really, really wanted it, because Angry Birds were there and all my friends were playing it. And I believe the absolute same will happen with uh, spatial computing devices. Uh, the massive number of players, the massive adoption will happen when the content will be so awesome that people will just want to grab it. And when when the young generation will want the device under a Christmas tree. This is when every other application will, will become understandable and relevant and no more questions will be asked. It will first come with entertainment content. So I'm saying, yes, it's amazing now, and it is inevitable in 2030. So for us to take Ruvio, our, our, our great uh, inspiration and role model for us, for us now it is time to iterate and see what is really going to be the Angry Birds. What really, it's going to be games, un, in, inevitable, undoubtful, it's going to be games. The question is, what is the kind of game? You were talking about the uh, leading a specific um, kind of game, a specific type. Is it gonna be a duel, a shooter, a, a, a quests, puzzles? This is the time to iterate through that. This is the time to see, because the medium is different. Honestly, it's becoming different with every new device released. So us, with the ability to iterate so quickly through different technology, different uh, glasses for that matter, it's time to iterate and it's time to see what will kick in 2030. So our, our 
roadmap towards that is to do exactly to understand what works with the technology that is coming and with the users that are going to grab it. Just following up on that, because for the short term, the paradigm is still like mobile AR. And there is no content that has yet been powerful enough to keep the users engaged. Um, so how do you like tackle that main challenge that it, nobody actually wants to play through their phone yet? It's, it's a brilliant question and it comes, it, 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 the question is deeper because it's even when AR will become less mobile, there will be less devices than mobile. So we would tackle it by expanding. We are not saying that we would make a game that lives in one platform. We're saying we're making this micro universes, the one with the robots that you saw. That one is actually playable on phones and tablets, on pass-through glasses, on full immersive VR, and on, uh, on AR uh, transparent glasses. So we're saying the content will be fluent. It will be taking players on with where they are, vacuum cleaning. So it's not one big experience. It's actually bits, nuggets of experience that go through different, uh, uh, different platforms. For that matter, a little bit of AR will be played on, on the phone. The same user in the same universe will then play another quest when he goes to school and so on. So we're just diversifying the content throughout of different platforms, that in, in the, therefore educating the users. Yeah, the, Tim, thanks for the pitch. I was just wondering, maybe you can talk about the past traction of your games, like the players you had, like maybe just uh, like the last years, what you've building, like how many people are playing it, what's happening there, just the past. Yeah. So uh, this is a dr brilliant question F for us. It's it's very interesting. So we, we don't have a marketing team and it's, it's really tough to, to bring our, our games in front, of, in front of eyeballs. But once it happened, we put, there was this bunny in the middle of, uh, of the lots of games that I showed. So that bunny is an Easter egg hunt lens on Snapchat that they just put it in their tab. And that was played 25 million times. So without any additional push, it was just there for people to discover. And 25 million people looked at it, and all 25 million that saw the four seconds preview got in to play it. So we know that what we have, people at least will want to try. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. And uh, I just want to take a moment. There's lots of people who have come because this is a really exciting session. You want to hear the pitches. Um, there are loads of seats in the auditorium. I just want to give you a minute now, quickly, if you're standing up, come and find a seat. There's quite a lot on this side before I introduce the next presenter. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. So, uh, yeah, good to, good to get you to rest your legs and, and be able to see properly. Um, so thank you to Tim, who just did his presentation. And now uh, I'd like to welcome to the stage Vendon and Reich, the CEO and CTO of Virtual Beings. Hello, everyone. I'm Vendy from Virtual Beings. We make AI characters that players actually want. And we do that because... Great AI characters are a sci-fi dream. They are everywhere in popular culture. In blockbuster movies like uh, Ready Player Me, uh, Ready Player One, sorry, Blade Runner, and many others, you always find virtue characters, and they are always portrayed as highly desirable and believable. Now, this has been noticed by investors. More than 100 million have been raised since the beginning of last year for AI character startups. And we at Virtue Beings, we've noticed a pattern which is a pure focus, an explicit focus on conversational AI. So basically what you get are characters that stand in front of you and talk a lot. Characters that are all talk and no action. And this is not something that game developers want. And they're very loud and vocal about this. Professional game developers on Twitter and on LinkedIn are asking for characters that 
move around freely, that interact with the player and with objects, and that integrate easily with gameplay. Without these features, you have characters that feel uncanny to players. This is where we come in, Virtue Beings. We are the developers of Cute Engine, our behavioral AI tech that powers characters that feel alive. Now here you, you see Tropico, our bird character, running on a Quest 2 headset, in real time, unscripted. The reactions of the bird to the player are very complicated. There's many things happening at the same time. We have demoed this to more than 100 people. When they take off the headset, they don't tell us, I just interacted with an AI character. They tell us, I just interacted with a living animal. And that's what we're going for, the illusion of life. Now, of course, we don't just do birds. We do all sorts of characters. And our characters are able to talk and to act. Now, you may ask yourself, what uh, can more well-funded startups like InWorld uh, and so on not just copy or buy our tech? And the answer is no because we are the original inventors of behavioral AI. We have done 12 years of R&D in the space. We have six provisional patents filed. And we have demos, like the ones you saw, that, speaks, uh, that speak uh, for themselves. I also brought um, a headset with me. Find me after this if you want to have a live demo of our bird character. And by the way, we are not currently for sale. On the contrary, we are already making revenue with two paid pilots successfully completed for a total revenue of just over half a million one with Resolution Games, the other with Matterless Studios. But our ambitions are bigger because we are targeting social gaming. Last year alone, this market was worth 27 billion. It's growing healthily. The top 10 games in the world today are all social games from Fortnite to Minecraft. Our mission is to grow this market further by turning all games into social games. And we can do that starting with single player games, which become social experiences when you add believable characters into them but all the way to multiplayer games, because it turns out that players and AI characters are complementary. Think about it. In games or in the metaverse, you don't want to be the bartender. You don't want to be the janitor. You want to be the guest. You want to be the star. And we're targeting other markets as well. Of course, XR, but also virtual education, virtual healthcare, and others. We are in the process of releasing our first showcase game. It's called Space Companions. It's basically a VR board gaming simulator, but with a twist because you get to play against fully animated AI opponents. Plus, you get to own a pet bird. We've developed this in just under three months. We have product velocity and uh, beta in, on App Lab coming out soon. Uh, I say showcase app because we are a B2B company and we are currently working, continue to work for the foreseeable future with clients who have clear ambitions for immersive characters. We charge them a monthly fee. We get to keep the tech that we license, and this creates a flywheel, which allows us over the next five years to be in many games um, and to become the platform that everybody uses in order to create and to maintain and to trade high-end AI characters. We have the right team for this. I myself, I'm ex-Stanford, ex-Cambridge. I spent the last 10 years in gaming. My business co-founder, Yin, has six years of experience uh, as an executive at large multinationals. Chris, our lead animator, is X Illumination. That's the Minion Studio, and the list goes on. We're now raising to realize the sci-fi dream of every gamer out there. We have a clean cap table. This is our first institutional round. We are raising 1.5 million via safes. 250 million safe is already committed and wired, by the way. We're not raising to fund ongoing operations, but to hire more top engineers to hit our next milestone five times faster. If you find this interesting, please find us after the show. Thank you so much. Thanks, Wendy. Um, I'd ask the question in a different way. Not can the big companies or, or who have raised a lot of money copy you, but how can you, with less funding, get market share because while your technology uh, probably is under the hood better than what they have, they have tens of millions of capital that they've raised just to buy market share. So that's, that's a big challenge. Like, what, What's your thoughts on that? Great question. So it turns out that you cannot just muscle your way into 
um, a market of very, very sophisticated, very selective game developers. Game developers are pros and they are skeptical of new kinds of technologies. They want to see the value and they look under the hood. That's why recently on LinkedIn you've had companies like Inworld, I'm going to mention them because they are kind of the big dogs, get completely trashed by uh, game developers who are skeptical that this is adding value to games. Cloud costs, latency, uncanny behaviors, like why would players care? We take it a step at a time. So we just work with studios one by one and we have a full sales pipeline. Our problem until now was that we didn't have a showcase. So people like you, like everybody can just download permissionless our app, check out what we're able to do and then see whether they want to take a sales call. So I think that's the limiting factor here. Uh, in terms of the sales, uh, you mentioned six new clients are in the pipeline, or is it the objective? Can you clarify? No, no we, we have like um, um, roughly 40 in the sales pipeline. Okay. Um, we have worked so far with two paid clients that I mentioned. Um, and um, like we, our, our goal is to have uh, six over the next 12 months, like six additional ones. And whether we call them paid pilots or whether this is going to transition to product, we are open to everything. And what type of company are you uh, targeting in terms of so the number of it, employees? It, just, uh, it turns out that there's two types of companies that we've had the most traction with so far. Gaming, obviously. Nobody's going to be surprised by that. But also, and this has been interesting in the context of the show, there's a lot of companies out there that now productize conversational AI for enterprise. For example, for training, for therapy, for filling the corporate metaverse, right? There's a lot of use cases for that, and they always tell us, we have characters that can talk now, that's table stakes, but they look uncanny because we can't make them behave. So I think this is going to be a very interesting use case over the next 12 years. We'll definitely work with companies in that space. That's my favorite too at the moment. Ask me in six months and my answer may evolve. Yeah, I was just wondering about the patents that you mentioned. We all know how hard it is to get them granted. Like, what are these patents actually protecting here? Uh, or just give us a rough, rough one, because this is probably really in detail. Yeah, yeah so yeah. these are provisional patents. We don't have the money to see a full patent application through at the moment. And it turns out that our tech probably won't need it. So I'm not saying we will, um, we will uh, publicize them, um, because... Uh, these are not process patents. They are, they are uh, uh, patents uh, for technology that's under the hood. It's inside our engine. And our engine drives the characters that you saw. It takes care of procedure animation. It uh, does um, navigation and pathfinding two orders of magnitudes faster than what you see in Unreal or in Unity. And it's not easy to access from the outside. So it's already well protected by tech, by obfuscation itself, and we may leave it there. Understood, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Do you have more questions? Yeah, just. Is there time? Um, so you alluded to in, in the, the panel, like AI is super busy. Um, and companies who have succeeded have kind of been able to get market share or mind share, not necessarily market share. So how do you turn your your research into actually thought leadership or being out there and proving that you're the technically best company? Yeah, this, this, this has really been become possible now thanks to the traction we've had in the fundraise uh, just a couple of months ago. We now had the time to hire um, a, a brilliant uh, PR manager who helps us get the word out. We are much more active now on LinkedIn, on Twitter. We have a lot to share. I have a Please come to my talk at 2 o'clock. I will talk about conversation and behavior AI to answer all of Petri's questions. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe it. It's the last, it's the last presentation, um, the last pitch. Um, so without any further delay, I'd like to welcome to the stage Stephanie Riggs, the founder of Ink and Paint. 
Thank you. It's great to be here at AWE in Vienna, where we get to see very cool tech during the day. And at nighttime, I've been going out to see live theater because these two things need to come together now more than ever. Around the world, a global crisis has been declared as theaters have started to reduce their seasons and close their venues. And there we go. All right. And this is happening because audiences have evolved. We're seeing increases in revenue in three major markets in the live, uh, in live event space, immersive environments, unique live performances, and interactive content. But there are challenges to each one of these. The immersive environments don't really have story. The uh, unique live performances don't have interactivity. And the interactive content kind of it has, it struggles with dramatic consistency. Ink and paint is a blended reality cabaret that brings together the most compelling elements of these three markets to answer the market demand for the next generation of live theatrical experiences. The best way to describe this, has everyone seen Who Framed Roger Rabbit? You know, the, the animated movie where the characters interact together um, or any other live action animated films? We are doing this, bringing these two worlds together, but we're doing it in the real world, in a real venue, in real time, and we've done it before. In a prototype built in collaboration with Carnegie Mellon students, which we installed in three days on Schubert stages on Broadway and had three hours of rehearsal time with actors, we recreated the iconic friend like me number from Aladdin with permission from Disney Theatrical Group. Only this time when Aladdin rubs a lamp, the genie flies up and out of the air and to everyone in the audience. We had sets magically appear, pyrotechnics, things that would be incredibly expensive in theater, materialized on stage. But the best part of this was that the response from our guests, age 8 to 78, was overwhelmingly positive. I love these comments, but I think the last one is really important. They expected AR to feel gimmicky because it has in the past when we've tried to combine live performance and AR. The hardware and the software just hasn't been there quite yet. And I know this because I've been working combining technology and storytelling for 25 years. I started working in VR in the mid-90s. I worked as a Disney Imagineer. I've directed award-winning films and experiential activations and led software startups. And I am proud to lead this incredible team of likewise double and triple threats. We have an, an XR team that's very well versed in theater, Oscar award-winning animation team, a powerhouse production team, and our designers can work both in classical mediums and in XR. This is a dream team. And we're building on the playtest and meeting audiences with a familiar and frictionless guest experience. So there's no software you need to download, no hardware you need to buy. You know, get a drink, take a seat, come in and enjoy the show because you are going to see some dazzling array of characters with um, live performances as well as animated characters. They're interacting with, these, with each other and with the audience. And this can be enjoyed with or without the preloaded devices, which are given to the audience as part of a magician's trick. It works really well in the story. But you can see in the space in the storyboard that there are redundancies around the space. So you can see the shadows and hear the sounds without having to use the devices. Even so, we're delicately balancing the AR scenes with scenes that don't need to be used at all, which is live action scenes. And this allows us to reduce the cognitive load, lighten the tech fatigue while elevating the spectacle. I call this the blended reality brawl. It's really fun. <laughs> um, we're doing this all in a prime location in Manhattan on, underneath a restaurant that is owned by Michelin award-winning restauranteurs. Right there. And to drive ticket sales, we have partnered with the world's largest immersive and experiential marketing platform in the world, Fever. They're a European-based company. They scaled Van Gogh Immersive to 5 million people over the world, US, Asia, and Europe. And our PR company is a bunch of nightlife uh, veterans in New York. Together, our team has a direct reach of over 125 million people. Our efficient business model starts with a tight budget of under a million dollars with Tony nominated producers already in committed ticket prices in line with New York City experiences, a robust performance schedule that has our investors fully recouped at 10 weeks at full capacity. And our investors are not waiting 10 years to see a return because we have an opening date set for the 27th of March, 2024. That's when we start generating revenue. That's when they start getting returns. At four years at full capacity, we hit the, t the coveted 10X 
purely by ticket sales, not including the subsidiary rights our investors are granted from a much larger multi-revenue roadmap, which allows us to expand outside of the theaters to virtual audiences, cities around the world, and licensing the back-end engine to other theaters so that they too can integrate dynamic content. So, it all starts now with visionaries like you. Please join our dream team. See you at the party on opening night. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, you had to rush through a little bit about the, the kind of scaling part. Um, so if you can talk to me a little bit about that. You have a, a location in New York, which you're operating under now. Um, and like location-based, like the revenue um, is a lot about supplemental income. So drinks and babies and stuff like that. Do you get a share of that, or is that the, the restaurant or the, the location that gets a part of that? And talk to me a little bit about, like, are you opening up other locations, and how do you, are you attacking kind of at-home experience as well? Yeah, absolutely. So, yes, we've got the ticket sales um, and then the supplemental income, the dinner and drink packages with the Ainsley Bowery. The ones that are sold through our packages are, we do get a cut of that revenue as well as, um, but anything that's sold separately at the bar, we're letting them or any packages that are, you know, if somebody comes and eats without buying a package, they get to keep that. But yes, we are... Um, we are looking at those packages as well as we have a sponsorship team that's already reaching out to sponsorships and we're also looking at production buyouts so that companies can come in and do buyouts or do backstage tours and, and sponsor things like that and also of course merch along those lines. So definitely looking to have multiple revenue streams even on that first, take, that, take those learnings and then as we open up additional um, locations around the world, implement those same practices there. Um, in terms of the, the device that the people in the audience receive, it's an iPad? Um, or is it what kind of device do, does the audience get to, to have this experience? And how is the product built? How are you going to update it um, in terms of, yeah, is it one show? Or are you planning different show? And how is the product and the device impacted by that? Yeah, absolutely. Right now we're using tablets. They are the most familiar for audiences walking in, going in, putting on a headset, figuring all that out, but big mess, right? So they're very familiar with, with tablets and that's also the most stable device at this point. We are happen to be launching around the same time that Apple Vision Pro is gonna be coming out and we're, seeing a, and we're making sure that our pipeline is open so that we can look towards porting if it's a frictionless experience for our audience because I think that that's the key part of any kind of experience is you wanna go in and have a great experience you don't want to be sitting there fussing around with technology for a long time. Um, but we are looking for that expansion. And with the virtual audiences, the way that we're thinking about the virtual audiences is not like you would have access to the show and like you'd be able to see it remotely, but think of it more like a Marvel universe where you're able to see certain elements of the show and through certain character perspectives. So we're not downplaying the ticket sales or removing the ticket sales, but allowing a different way for audiences to come in and enjoy the show and maybe even buy it on top of of having to see in the live experience. Yeah, thanks Stephanie for this great pitch. I really like your energy as well. You're really enthusiastic and everything. I think the audience can all feel that. I was just wondering like how long is a show like this then? And there's probably also a pause in between, I assume. Or, and then they have the drinks probably, or how is that usually? Yeah. And then also regarding the headsets, um, is maybe you can also get these headsets sponsored, right? I was wondering, like, if you need to buy like all these headsets, yeah. Maybe yes, just, yeah. yes. I mean, the coming in and enjoying the show and just having a great time is our our key metric here. Um, what was your first question, Chris? The first question was regarding how long is the show? How long is the yeah. show? The length of the show is seventy five minutes. Yeah. So what it allows us to do is have two shows a night so that we can turn the audience over and then bring in a new audience so we can double our revenue. We've kept the audience size quite small and intimate. It's really an elevated experience, so um, we want people to come in and feel like they've really seen something special. Yeah. Oh, perfect, perfect, that's nice. Thank you. And the second question was regarding the headsets, if you get them sponsored because buying them, or are you renting them, or how is that? Because the headsets, we all know, they're getting like out of date. Otherwise, you know, they get out of dated and then new ones come out. So you probably either rent them yes. or lease them and then... 
Well, right now it's actually cheapest for us to buy them um, and keep them because we need to keep them updated and rotated within. But that being said, as we start looking towards adapting this and porting it to new technologies, 100% um, sponsorship. We've already been talking with um, headset makers that are really excited about using this to feature their content because uh, when you think about AR, it's it goes into, like, if you're using it in regular space, lighting messes it up, the context messes it up. This allows them to feature AR in a space and in an environment where it it shows it off. It's, it's designed for it. It's glorious. Um, so they're very excited to show the hardware with um, content that where it really works. Nice, yeah. Thank you. Good luck. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much there to Stephanie, who was the last of our presenters. So that's the end of the pitches. Um, our judges are going to deliberate and choose the next startup to watch winner. That's going to be announced just to remind you this afternoon at the wrap up and best in show ceremony, 425 main stage. Don't miss that. Um, thanks to our judges, Lean Sagers, Chris Oberida, and Petri Rayahama. So a big round of applause for them. And of course, for our eight presenters. <laughs>